And with that, we'll be launching the Women Entrepreneurship Report. But first, let me please bring on stage and invite Srikant Sastri, President Thai Delhi NCR and Chairman I3G Advisory Network and talk about the report presentation. Yes, we can please give it up for Srikant. A big round of applause for Srikant before we hear him, hear from him about the report presentation. Yeah, so I'm not going to make any boring announcements. I'm going to set the ball rolling for the discussion on women entrepreneurs. But here's the curveball. We talk about demographic dividend, but I'm going to start by talking about my mother and mother-in-law. Those were the first two women entrepreneurs that I encountered in my life. And in many ways, they were the inspiration for my own journey as a serial entrepreneur. They're both excellent math and physics teachers who taught dozens of school kids with patience, empathy, and humor. When I watched them in action, it gave me strength, built my own temperament. And I'm willing to place a bet. If they'd been around in today's generation, I bet they'd have built a large edtech company because they were far more enterprising than their poor husbands. And Today, I'm super excited because Thai Delhi NCR, Zeno, Google, NetApp, Indian Angel Network, we all came together to look at the contribution of women founders to the Indian startup ecosystem and figure out where the opportunities lie to accelerate them. Let me start with a very silly question. Please don't beat me up for it, but I'll answer the question myself as well. Why do we need more women co-founders, women founders? The answer, one simple answer is women account for 50% of buyers of products and services. And if you leave it to men to design those products and services, you'll never get the kind of products and services women want to buy. So to me, that's one simple enough reason, a very practical reason enough to say we need more women entrepreneurs. Without that, we're not going to make headway at all. So with that silly question out of the way, let me dive into five significant findings from a report about women entrepreneurship. The first finding, and someone will need to give me the clicker, please. Slight clicker. So while we wait for the click, uh, them to put the presentation up, let me also, let me start talking in any case in the interest of time. The first finding was that women are as successful as men in running, sorry. Which is the forward? Which is the forward? So women are as successful as men in running a startup. Their odds of success are similar. Look at this chart. Seven out of 1,000 women-founded startups reached the later stage. The number for men was similar, eight out of 1,000. Quite simply, women are as successful as men in running a startup. So that's the first bit of good news. The second bit of good news is, if you look at the unicorns in India, we have 17 unicorns where at least one of the founders is a woman which collectively raised $12 billion of equity. So they're able to create unicorns, they're able to raise a lot of money, and that's the second bit of good news. The third one is, a lot of people say women don't want to start deep tech startups. Not true. Women founders are not scared of deep tech. When I travel around the country mentoring entrepreneurs at incubators, I meet lots of excellent women-founded startups that are absolutely deep tech. Machine learning, IoT, biotech, computer vision in diverse sectors, healthcare, agri-tech, fintech. So you can see on this chart that a comparable percentage of men-led and women-led startups are leveraging deep technology. The other bit of good news, women as inventors. We said 
okay, fine, you're working in deep technology, but are you doing fundamental work to create new products and technologies which are truly inventive in nature? Look at this once again. Similar percentage of women are inventive as are the men. So lots of good news. So many women founders are creating successful startups. They're pushing the boundaries of deep technology and they're being inventive. So if that's the case, what's going wrong? There are only 18% of startups that have women founders. Why is that number not increasing? It's been stagnant over the past decade. And they want, and you might say they don't want to be entrepreneurs. Not true. Look at this chart. Women have a high intent of starting up a, and becoming an entrepreneur. It's a slightly higher percentage than men. So they want to be entrepreneurs, they're very good at it, they make a success of it, they leverage technology well. So what's holding them back? And we decided to do a bit of a deep dive, and uh, that's not on the slide, that'll be the topic of the panel discussion, but let me give you a sneak peek. The biggest thing we found was that the family and society support that's required to give shape to that entrepreneurial dream, that turns out to be the single biggest factor, and that is a topic that we should discuss in the panel when it comes up. So those were the highlights of the report. And what I'd like to say is that a full report, which is going to be unveiled shortly and is available on the website, has all the details, all the recommendations for what's holding back women entrepreneurship and what's required to change that. And I hope you enjoy the discussion that happens uh, after this. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful rest of the day. With that, I'd like to get the rest of the panelists up here to continue the discussion. Thank you, Shrikant, for setting the tone for this panel. Let me quickly invite on stage our esteemed panelists. Let me start by inviting Apurv Chamaria, Head of Startups and VC Google India. Can we give it up for him, please? Next on stage, I'd like to invite Padmaja Ruparel, co-founder, IAN, and founding partner, IAN Fund. Padmaja, thank you for coming over. Please, can we have a big round of applause? Ravi Chhabria, Managing Director, NetApp India. I would love to have you on stage, sir. And the panel will be moderated by none other than Atit Danak, partner and head, Zinov. Can you please give it up for this esteemed panel, please? And yes, I am missing on one panelist, my bad. Let me invite on stage Anuja Dhavan, co-founder Dubverse. Anuja, we're very delighted to have you on stage. And now that the panel is complete, please give a big round of applause before we begin this panel. So thank you so much, everyone. I think we have a big responsibility. It's an important topic. But we also have people, you know, staying away from their lunch. As I say, we're going to balance both the things out today, right? Um, uh, you know, women entrepreneurs, women founders, this topic, you know, we have been discussing for a long time. It's a topic we need to discuss for multiple reasons. Um, Shrikant, you know, I'll get the ball rolling from what you had said, right? Uh, we have women entrepreneurs at about 17 to 18% of the ecosystem. Uh, however, it seems that for a couple of years now, it's been very stagnant percentage, right? That percentage pool has not really increased. Um, what is the reason, right? Is it, is it even possible to reach 50%? I know it's important, but why is it so stagnant? I think all of us who are in this room are partly responsible because we're very obsessed by technology entrepreneurship. Uh, for some reason, we continue to believe that entrepreneurship equals technology. A lot of women want to be entrepreneurs, but may not want to be uh, building a tech product. They'd want to do a variety of other businesses, and somehow we've not addressed those needs by supporting them. That's reason number one. Reason number two is there are areas where women are already, now if you come to technology, women are already there in large numbers in academic institutions. Biosciences is one great example. Large number of students in biosciences at masters and PhDs. Have we worked with them to say, look, you're doing great work as part of your research. Can that be converted into an invention and a product? I think we need to focus on specialized sectors like those where women are already doing cutting edge work. So two reasons, actually. Uh, Anuba, uh, what's your take on the subject? 
Uh, so basically being a part of uh, the startup ecosystem for about uh, 10 years now, what I really think is that it's a, a problem of more women, more women in the founding team, right? Uh, so if you look at these successful startups around, where have they come out of are these uh, bigger mafia groups, right? Flipkart mafia, PayPal mafia, we've seen right. all of those. But if you look at the founding team, there are zero women founders is what I would say. Hence the ripple effect of whatever these successful startups create is not being carried forward. So uh, I believe that's one of the major problems uh, that we do not have enough women working as founding uh, member teams. Now why that's the problem is, uh, is, is a broader perspective of lesser females in the workspace, uh, lesser female uh, ready to take those risks out there. And those are more societal things. And definitely I think the whole society has to sort of come together to make that number better. Got it. Uh, but uh, Padmanjha, uh, I want to touch upon the societal piece a bit, right? In terms of women want to be entrepreneurs, it's actually higher than men, right? Uh, one is society, one is maybe personal also. Uh, you know, given the ringside view that you have had, the fact that you have also been building an organization like IN, what's your take? Like, how big is the society, this uh, behavior piece to it? You know, Atit, I think uh, the way I look at it, uh, I would echo to some extent what Srikant said, that we look at women in either who are tech, building tech companies, or who are building VC-funded, fundable companies. I think there is a large number of entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs out there, and if you go even penetrate deeper into tier two, tier three, these women entrepreneurs are doing Soho businesses, or they are building small, small home businesses, and they are almost the mainstay of running homes. Right? So I think there are women entrepreneurs out there, but we've never really looked at them. Uh, we are lo constantly looking at them from a fundable perspective. So I think that's one piece. The second piece, I think, which is, which is to echo what she's saying, that while there are Flipkart and PayPal, I think we as women have not come out and created our own mafias or our own groups in some ways. Right? I think we are, very, we, we are sort of head down just as a woman myself, I mean, I'm head down trying to do what I need to do, keep one day to the next day. But have we really built, and I think that's a failure, right? To have built a circle of women around us so that we can share, we can learn, we can, it becomes a support system and create more women entrepreneurs, right? Create that. So I think that's a big issue. But what is really also important that in our society, it is largely a patriarchal society. Right. Even, even in tier one, mentally, I see that, right? And we, if you try and say, okay, we're gonna change that, that's going to take forever, amen, right? How do you leverage that is what is important to do. And that is where the problem lies, that you have too many battles to actually fight. You have the home, you have children, you have your business, you have uh, cultures to manage. Right. So I think that's the big issue that you're fighting all the time. All the time. So if I can just add to that, I think building on what Padmaja said, if I put it in simple terms, I think men like me and our generation are absolutely useless when it came to helping out at home. <laughs> uh, if you take my own example, my wife actually became an entrepreneur before I did. Oh, wow. But okay. in reality, she had to shoulder the responsibility at home, uh -huh. and therefore that took a hit. And whereas I was kind of focused on the business, so the day people like me stop becoming useless and become more useful at home, I think some things will change, but I'm hopeful. Because if you look at my son, my older son, he, is, he lives in the US, but he's the one who cooks. But unfortunately, his wife doesn't want to become an entrepreneur. So otherwise, <laughs> you'd have seen an entrepreneur coming. But, but let me, you know, Srikant always is like this, let me say. But I think if I know somebody who mentors women, it's him. No, no, absolutely. Irrespective you know, of gender, I've seen actually she can't do it. And I think what, what it really says is something else. I think just as we keep saying this, that behind every successful man there is a successful woman, uh, there is a woman behind him, actually behind one successful woman there are many men. Oh, you wow. know, you have mentors, you have partners, you have spouses, you have children. They all pick up their little bits they give, in, give and support, encourage, and that's how it comes. Because a woman has multiple roles. Whether we like it or not, they have a multiple roles to play. And if each one picks up those roles, or at least participates in it, I think it goes a long way. 
So I think I want to use this opportunity to actually thank the many men who've actually supported women who've, who've taken a step ahead in life. So thank you. So I don't want to take up time, but I want to say if the reason I mentor women now, it's my way of doing priyashchit. Because <laughs> I was useless with my generation, at least I can make up for it by mentoring women now. It's my priyashchit Padma. That's I, I, I think no. I'd add to that, wherein the real life example is what I would say. So definitely whatever I'm able to do and to push harder is because of the partner and the extended family that I have. So that really allows you to do a lot more than what you would have done otherwise. No, absolutely. I think we all need our ecosystems and there's one excellent point, Anuja, that you brought up, right, in terms of the fact that a lot of entrepreneurs today are coming from other startups, right? Uh, so one of the things that this report found out was that a significant percentage of entrepreneurs come with professional work experience, right? Uh, and Ravi, I want to bring you in here in terms of, uh, there seems to be a similar pattern in terms of, say, the workforce. Women in STEM is increasing. Women in STEM workforce has been, again, very consistent from a, you know, percentage perspective. So what's your take as an enabler, as an orchestrator in the ecosystem? And as I was reading a pre-brief of the report, the parallels are very, very clear. Uh, you look at the women that enter STEM jobs in companies like ours, the numbers are very high, 38%. I date myself, my first job was at Sun Microsystems when we had kind of introduced this Park Station 1 built out Solaris. I remember somebody coming in telling me, I want to thank you and all your countrymen. This is in Silicon Valley because you've brought women into the computing workforce. So India did make a difference. But that said, the numbers are bleak. And they're not just bleak, I think, in the accelerator business. They are also bleak in uh, corporates. And there's many reasons for it. And I think a lot of them are mentioned in the report. A lot of these, I think, Padmaja, as you point out, they are generational issues also. and. I'll say this, there's a lot of techniques you apply to it, but I think at the core of it, you have to understand that not just as a society in India, but as a, maybe as a vertical business, and actually it's not even a vertical, as business, I think it's very male dominated, very, very, very male dominated even today. And you have to understand that. So some of the techniques you might apply, you may get the token woman in, for an interview. I don't know it's going to pay off. Apurva is going to talk about techniques they use in Google. I won't take that from him. But I'll also tell you this, that if you have someone being assessed by all men, you're being assessed by the same lens. Okay? Fair, I'll fair, give you a real fair. example. I used to drop my son to school when he was uh, five years old. I was the one who at one point dropped him off to the daycare when he was eight months old in California. You didn't have the, you know, luxury of a nanny or a mother-in-law that could take care of people. The thing is, I didn't feel as guilty as my wife did. Uh -huh. And when my wife did it and I did it, people didn't spend the rest of the year talking about me doing it. But they sure as hell did talk about my wife doing it. She comes in 20 minutes late every day because of this. So these are very deep-rooted biases and I think you have to hit at it from that angle very clearly. A fair point. So, Mr. Poor, you want to add to that? Uh, what's your take with? Uh, uh, we, so, we spoke about ecosystem. We spoke about different topics, different areas to focus on. We spoke about the role of the family, you know, as individual in terms of enabling someone on their dreams. Uh, of course, the inbuilt bias in the system, which sort of slows things down. But as an investor, as you know, chai charter member, uh, member, what have you seen? What's impacting the stop of the funnel? Why are we not going beyond that 18 percent? So. My personal experience as an angel investor, 40% of my portfolio is actually women founders. And I would love for it to be more, uh, not from a DEI or <laughs> any other perspective, but women make like, really insanely awesome entrepreneurs. Uh, they've always had it tough, right? School, college, workforce, uh, the conviction they have and the purity of purpose they have when they start something and the detail orientation they have is phenomenal. And most of my exits have come from women entrepreneurs. Okay, so that's an important point. Huge call out to all investors out there. <laughs> so I keep uh, asking everybody, I said, you know, <laughs> including my portfolio companies that introduce me to more, they will build sounder businesses, they will build deeper businesses, uh, They'll be very upfront, candid, 
they will never oversell. So uh, I think as investors in this room and as a founders, uh, recruit more women as co-founders, invest in more women, mentor more, more women, and fundamentally what Amitabh was talking about in the morning, 33,000 per capita GDP, uh, we will reach sooner than later. Purva, can you just, if I might, do your job a little bit, I think. Do you have to look harder for the women founders? Do you make an extra effort? I don't make an extra effort because if you see wins, you automatically prioritize that. Initially, it started as a thesis that 50% of the workforce is women and no investor is proactively looking at it. Yeah. So it was like a blue ocean. So I was one of the early ones to develop a thesis and back it started getting incredible results, so I doubled down. So you were looking for it. You, looking you figured that's yeah. something you need to look for. I think that Some thesis don't play out, this plays out well. So I think what Apurva said is a good reason for optimism. There's one more reason I think we should be optimistic. When I went to IIT many decades ago, we had two girls in a batch of 250. Wow. It was disappointing for another set of reasons at that point <laughs> of time. But we went for a reunion three weeks ago the percentage is up to 25 to 30 percent. Wow. So when three to five years down the line, when this workforce looks at entrepreneurship as a possibility, that percentage has already gone up, actually. So I would actually add for one more reason why women entrepreneurs should be there. Uh, see, women are actually the purchasers. They are the consumers, right? They're doing most of the purchases in the market, Absolutely. right? Yeah. So they understand what to buy. They know what they need. They have the pro they understand problems. So certain class of products is completely women oriented, right? The best person who to, to build a company is those who p feel the pain, those who know the need. So I think, irrespective of gender, I would say that just purely because they are the purchasers, they are the best guys to uh, build a business. But having said that, what really irks me today is, and we are young as an investing uh, country, right? Early stage investing country, uh, especially angels, less than 1% right. are women. Right. So, you know, that is something which is even more uh, stark, that why do we have such few women investing, right. right? And in one way you said the number of women entrepreneurs who've succeeded are, so, are a fraction right and so many of them coming back is going to be a fraction of a fraction right. but the reality is if we don't get more women investors we will continue to have certain biases that will remain no, absolutely especially and for women focused products for femtech products it needs women investors so absolutely. i think that's something we need to also and that ties in well with ravi's point earlier also in terms of the Corporate hiring. I'm again going to ask a question on your behalf because here's what happens in the corporate. When you decide that you're not getting enough women candidates, you mandate it. People don't like quotas, but I think there is a reality that you need enough of a panel. You can do that even for an interview panel you set up. How do you do that for investors, though? That's, Very I think, difficult. a tough one. No? Very difficult. So what we've tried to do in a different, uh, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, ecosystem, we've tried to create a group of women private equity players. So we, while we are sort of creating talent, but we are hoping as they grow and as, they, as their careers go, they get into the investing business and start doing it. But as angel investors, pulling them out is very difficult. Right? That's true. Uh, they yep. Many of them don't even have a control on the family office monies, right? Correct. So I think those issues still... But I have a suggestion. Out. If you will make a commitment, I'm willing to make another commitment. Why don't we commit that Indian Angel Network will run a program only to train women to become angel investors? Exactly. If you make that commitment, I'll make another commitment. I do programs on how to pitch to investors, storytelling cohort programs. I commit to create a similar cohort only for women. So if you, is that a deal? And I think that's an awesome thing. You know, if you look at what we did with our Accelerate Her program, mm -hmm. People think we were trying to create opportunity for just women. We were trying to create opportunity for entrepreneurs inside the company. They needed to see role models, right. you know, nurturing them and creating them. I think you have to just flip the cycle of, you know what, you have to prove yourself if you're a woman or you're proven if you're a man. And there's so many anecdotes. The report mentions to it too. I'm, you witness it every day. Yesterday, there was a woman engineer in our team 
who talked about, well, I'm not exactly sure I'm ready. You talk to 10 women, uh, 10 men, they are like 10% of that preparation <laughs> and they already think they can do the job after that, right? So it's on my journey. It makes me VP by the time I'm 35. So perfect. So I think I do want to end the panel right now because we have a partnership here and you should end on a high, but I still have one more question. <laughs> Uh, so we spoke of top of the funnel. Uh, the second question is again similar, right? 18% women founders, 10% of the funding. First question, is that even the right metric to chase? If it is the right metric, then how, do, how does one solve for it? What has your experience been? Uh, I'll maybe start with Tanmaja first, yeah? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a complex answer, right? Uh, perhaps because I'm a woman. So I think as an investor, as a VC, I would say yes. That is something that needs to be solved. We need to have more women entrepreneurs, and you already heard a lot of reasons that we discussed. But uh, if I look at it from a different lens, I think that's not a good enough parameter because we are not talking about fundable entrepreneurs or businesses. Right. We're talking about women entrepreneurs building businesses, right? And therefore, we have to widen the parameter. We have to widen the framework so that more women come in and build businesses, which also has new challenges that need to be sorted. For example, bank, debt, grant, building, you know, how do you build companies? How do you, how do you bring all of that? It cannot be an all women company also, you know, gender diversity will be required. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a, there are new challenges, but I do believe that the framework for women entrepreneurs has to be wider beyond funding. Got it. So I would love if it's... Yeah. So I'm going to say that, look, while this room is full of investors and engineers who like numbers, I would say in this case, ignore the numbers, partly because numbers are how you measure them. If you measure how many women founders among tech entrepreneurs, you'll get a low number. How many women entrepreneurs in India's population at large, you'll get a larger number. So forget the numbers. Instead, let's follow Bhagavad Gita's principle, karm karo, phal aayega. Let's agree on, <laughs> do the, all the things that we agreed upon today. But karam karna pad I think you have to do it. If I look at it even in the corporate environment, if you measure something, you will do something about it. And fundamentally, if you look at the world out there being 50-50, and you look at anything else that's not 50-50, you come up with a logical reason for why it is, and there's a bias at the bottom of it, or there's a system at the bottom of it that needs to be fixed. You know, you can't start with the premise, women don't want it. Hmm. Yeah, you can't. So once you come up with that, you just have to unravel it one step at a time, and the number will get to 50-50. It has to, otherwise something else is wrong. Yeah, so definitely that's one of the way to look at it, one of the number definitely. But eventually what really matters is the capital, right? Where which companies are going bigger is going with capital. Mm -hmm. So that cannot, uh, in my opinion, be left behind and said that they will catch up or there are other important things those are being done. So again, I think it's more personal from that standpoint. Uh, it's not that every business is built to become a billion dollar company. Uh, they can solve for a wider problem, they can solve for a masses and maybe not just focus on the valuation if I may. Uh, so that's a more of a personal choice, but I think from a more uh, top to bottom approach, it's definitely about capital and that's an enabler, right? That I am able to do more because there is a backing that I have. There's somebody who's validating my idea and I can go further with it. So definitely, I think an important uh, metric to track uh, for at least uh, the, the top people to make sure that we're able to improve it year on year and get more people and enable more fem female founders. All right, so at least what I'm gathering is it's, it's always good to have a metric because it's easier to align people. But to Padmaja's point also, the metric can always evolve. It, it's something we keep discovering for now, that 50-50 on the funding. For now, is a good enough thing for us to chase now because why not? Kind of a bit, right? But there's a lot more to this whole business in terms of solving for success, right, overall. Uh, I just want to get into your experiences real quick, right? Uh, just five more minutes, right? Um, what's worked, what's not worked as you've tried to solve this problem? Uh, can you give an example? All of you. I, I just want to sort of understand what's your perspective been in terms of uh, what worked for you when somebody tried to help or you know, when you asked for help and what didn't. Yeah. Ask for help. Yeah. Or so you got help, yeah. Sure, sure. No, no, it has always worked out is what I would say. Uh, in this last uh, one, one and a half year of journey, I think wherever we are today is because of the community and the support that we get. Uh, Google has been a brilliant partner. There are other uh, people in the ecosystem. We have our angel investments uh, and angel investors who sort of support us along the way. Uh, 
I would not say that's just because because I'm a female founder uh, that I think the startup community within India is very, very strong and right. they are more than willing to uh, do if you are asking for directed help, right? Mm -hmm. If you just go out and say, run my business, that's not possible. But if you're going out with a directed question, I think uh, you definitely get that help uh, from uh, from the people who've done it, people who've arrived in life in a certain way. So I think Indian ecosystem is the place to be at uh, from a startup uh, standpoint. Uh, being a female, I definitely see that additional uh, nudge sometimes that they really want us to succeed mm -hmm. and I, I see that happening and I'm happy that I'm in the right place at the right time. So making the most out of it. Uh, Ravi, how about you? Speaking for the accelerator as well as for the corporation, when you look at the number of women ex uh, startup founders we have or even if you look at the number of women leaders we have, it's a journey. It is starting and I think in the last two to three years it looks like qualitatively there is a difference in that process. Not just that it's driven from the top down, but I think there is a belief that we are not doing right if we don't get to a bigger, better number. Got it, got it. I think uh, when I started, it was uh, difficult. Let me be very honest, it wasn't easy. Uh, even getting up and speaking was a challenge, to be honest. But I think what really worked for me was people nudged me, supported, pushed, to an extent, and I think that was necessary, which I didn't see at that time, but I think it's very important. Interesting. And uh, I think what also worked is have faith in people around you, right? Okay. If you have faith and just, just let yourself go and allow yourself to go with the wave, I think that works. And if I look at today's founders, women founders, I think there is a lot more confidence, there's a lot more gravitas, if I may use the word, the, as they build young companies. But, um, but I think what's still missing is that element of networking, that element of being able to share. Uh, and that's why I think a woman mafia is a good idea. You're definitely in for a mafia for sure. <laughs> yeah. If I may add to that, like, I think that's, that's more a, of how we are brought up in at least an Indian yeah. ecosystem, right? So that really needs to change not at just a, a corporate level, but maybe at the childhood level. That's more of schooling because we are always uh, more protected in a certain way that don't talk to this person, don't go out alone, so on and so forth. And I think that somewhere gets so deeply rooted that I can't go out and do it. But once you break that barrier, obviously, I think yeah. the community uh, that we have here is open enough uh, to accept you in a certain way. But uh, it's more our mental barriers in a certain so way that opening we... Opening up and trusting becomes... Abur, what I've seen really work very well uh, for women founders whom I've backed and also my anti-portfolio is they're very okay being imperfect. Uh, I see more women aiming for perfection than men. I think <laughs> men know they're not perfect <laughs> and they're not going to get there. <laughs> Women want a perfect product, a perfect team, a perfect cap table. Uh, many things, right? Uh, they're very thoughtful and deliberate, which can be incredible strength, but as an entrepreneur, it can slow you down. As investors and entrepreneurs, we always straddle the world between not knowing and not knowing at all. <laughs> so <laughs> even when we due diligence a deal or we speak to a founder, so to all the women entrepreneurs out there, just get super comfortable not knowing and not being perfect and revel in your imperfection. And that's going to take you up. I think I agree with both uh, Padmaja and Apoor. Uh, networking, an area that a lot of women founders don't feel comfortable with. His point about striving for perfection, uh, a famous saying, great is the enemy of good that plays out here. There's often pragmatism required in an ambiguous environment. But what works for women is the makeup for both of these things by working very, very, very hard. Absolutely. I've been fortunate that in both my ventures, I had women co-founders who worked very hard, made my life simple, and the business did well. I agree with you. I mean, my team which has worked on this report has been all women team. And I've been chilling, you know, honestly, on that particular piece. Um, if we can uh, get both the Divyas and Neharika to stand up, so, big round of applause for all three of them. I can tell you they've pulled many all-nighters. Uh, they've challenged all the status quo. Fantastic work done by all three of you. Thank you. And on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll not keep you from the lunch. Uh, there's a full report which is being released. 
uh, I'll request the panelists to maybe, you know, uh, help sort of highlight the report to everybody here. It's going to be available for download from today afternoon, post lunch onwards. Please have a look. Uh, and everybody here on the stage has contributed a lot in making this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for launching that report. And I'd like to please request the panelists to please stay on the stage and allow us to felicitate you with the gifts from our gifting partners, Naturic Company. And can we please have a big round of applause for our panelists for this very candid and phenomenal session, which had quite a few commitments rolling on the stage, which I, as an entrepreneur, can't look forward to enough. Thank you so much.